Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. This is Engineering Change Management. My name is Janice and I'm going to be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this event through Teams Live Events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. By participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not get sent to being a part of a recorded session, we ask that you please disconnect now. Attendees may access the web conference recording by the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the presentation. I'd like to thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now on to the main event. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Program Manager Beatrice Nemo Gracia. So without any further delay, Beatrice, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dennis. So today we are going to learn about what are the new engineering change management capabilities. You've probably seen it called as engineering change management, add-in for Dynamics 365 supply chain management. So what is it exactly that we are going to go through today? What is engineering change management? What is the functionality that it brings? How can you enable it to try it out or to use it? What happens for existing customers that want to leverage this? And a small update on the roadmap related to engineering change management. So the first thing is, what is engineering change management? In the title, I called it as an add-in. Uh, the first thing uh, to know is that we call add-in something that needs to have something special to enable it. In this case, we'll see that it has a feature and a configuration key. So that's why we call it an add-in. But as such, it's part of supply chain management, it's part of its functionality. The licensing is also the same. It's based on the touch licenses. So, no, it's the name that relates to a set of functionality. Well, what is all this functionality about? So it's a solution, Is it? it's a set of features that brings structure and discipline to the product data management process. It helps you making it more processed. A lot of processes that were outside of the system in many cases now can be in the system. How is this being made? So this stronger data management comes through version control. The products are going to have different versions that is the way to control the changes on a product along its life, along its life cycle. And between those versions of the product, that's where the change management happens. You're going to have a track of what were those changes in between two versions with change requests and change orders. That's what is understood as engineering change management. So what are these changes in the product? What could those be? So for discrete manufacturers, it's very useful to manage the changes in components. What are those components in the bill of materials? If there are any changes and in the routes of a product. For process manufacturers, it's very useful to keep track of what are the changes in the ingredients of a formula, in the quantities, for example, if one ingredient is being changed by another, in the co-products or byproducts of it. Uh, the process manufacturing part is coming on April 2021. It's not something that is there at the moment, but that's something you will expect soon. A part of these main changes 
you can also keep track of smaller changes such as quantity of uh, components or attributes as well. And how do you manage these changes? You manage them using workflow, which is very useful to keep track of who has the ownership controlling these changes. And as well, you do this across multiple entities. So we are going to see that there's a way to manage these changes. So there's one organization or company controlling these changes and then you will have the control to which data goes to which company. Which, in the end, what is all this increased data quality for? So the fact that you have more structure, more discipline, is going to increase your data quality, the, real, the reliability of your data, making changes smoother, which in the end is reducing the time to get to market with your products. If you are familiar with the ISV to increase, this was their product engineering solution that we have acquired and we have enhanced, made many enhancements. So what I'm going to show today is the full set of functionality that is at the moment. So let's go deeper into each of the topics. We are going to start with product version management. These product versions, then how do we control them in a company? How do we release them? That's where the enhanced product release will come into play. A specific set of functionality that is called the release, the re readiness control, sorry, uh, to ensure that the setup data is correct. How do you manage the changes with the lifecycle management and where that product is used in different types of transactions, managing the changes with requests and orders, product search, and engineering attributes. These are like the main topics or groups of the functionality that are what you will see on the right. So I'm going to go through each of those. The main concept that we are bringing is the version management. So now you know that with products, we have the concept of product and the reality of that product data lays in the product. So now the versions come. With the version, there's a lot of information that is going to be on the product version and not on the product anymore. So we are going to have engineering attributes, we're going to have documents, we're going to have the bill of material, and we are going to have the route at the product version level. We are going to see that the tracking and logistics of this product version is going to be optional. I'll show you what that is in a moment. Thanks to a new product version dimension that we have introduced. So the products that are versioned, we call them engineering products. It's not a separate concept. It's the fact that these engineering products, they are going to be versioned and they are going to be managed with engineering change. So in between versions, you would always have these change orders. Keep track of the changes. So how would we create an engineering product? So from the release product details page that you're used to see, there's going to be a new pane that is under product, new engineering product. So when you click it, it will open uh, to create a new engineering product. It's very important to see in which company we are at the moment. Notice that now we are in DMF. 
So this is the company in which the product is created and will be controlled. We'll see more of that later. So when we create the product, the first thing we have to choose is the engineering product category. This is a set of defaults and values that will apply to the product. And it basically helps you manage them easier. So when you select it, then you automatically default the version number, for example, or which are some engineering attributes that you can create already from here. We select already the category and then we go to the release products page. We have create the product and we can see the version from here or also on the side pane. We have created already the first version. And when we open it, this is the information that is going to be held at the version level. We can see if it's active or not, which are its effectivity dates that this version applies, which is its lifecycle state, its product number as well. Yes, the engineering organization. We can see the engineering attributes here as well, documents, bill of materials, and the route would be as well on the bottom of the page. So what do we mean by that tracking the version in logistics is optional? So when you create an engineering product, actually it's when you create the category uh, from which from where this is going to be defaulted, you have two options. To track the version in transactions, that is what we see here on the left, and then the version dimension will be used. Think of it as the other dimensions, as color or size or style. There's a new one that is version. So then the product will be a product master, and each of the versions will be a variant. And then this way in each transaction, you would have a product variant, which means that you will always have specified which is the version that was sold or the worst purchased, for example. This has the pros that you can always keep track of the version, but it also has the cons that you would need to manage stock at the version level as well. So what we actually see that most customers use is to not track the version in transactions, which means the product is still going to be versioned. You're still going to manage the changes with change requests, change orders, being able to control which is the version of that product in a specific company. But this version dimension is not going to be used. So instead of creating a product master and variants, we are going to create only a product underneath. And how we control this is with the engineering category. So remember that when we created the product, we always had to choose the engineering category. So then in the engineering category, then we have this toggle, track version in, in transactions. So this is an example where it's set to yes. So, you know, you see that product subtab is product master and product dimension group is version. We could always choose to use another dimensions like version and style, for example. And this is another example where we set it to no. So then it's going to always be product subtype product. The toggle basically helps us with uh, the choice. But then how do we ensure that only the engineering organization, the one that is designing how the products are can specify this engineering data. So 
there's literally an engineering organization concept. And if we want even more control for product, we have the concept of product owner that you saw when we were creating the product, which is basically a person assigned to a product that is going to be the only one that can release it. So what is this engineering organization then? So an engineering organization is organization on the data model, which you know you can set it up as an external system, but if you want to just keep it internal, don't want to connect it to another PLM system, that would be the usual case. It's basically a company. And the company would control the data for that product. You can set it up as you want in the sense of the engineering organization can be your company where you know only the design of products is done or it can also be the same company where you transact on if you then want to set it separate you can as well have many different engineering organizations and then each engineering organization would control a specific set of products. So this engineering organization is going to be the only one that controls this engineering data. And from this engineering organization, then the data is going to be released to other legal entities, maybe to a manufacturing one, to another manufacturing and to a service center. In this case, it's important that there is control over which information is, set, is sent to which company. So the engineering organization will release, for example, for the manufacturing plants, the product with the bomb, and then not release to the service center the bomb, or even release different routes to different manufacturing plants if they have different types of machines. So this effectively means that the same product has different versions in time. And as those versions can be released to different companies, then at a specific point in time, different companies have different versions. In this example, you see that at the beginning, both companies, USMF and BRMF, have version one. Then in the sign, there's a version two that maybe has some errors, so it's never released to the market. Then a version three comes to only USMF. And then finally, a version four comes to both. Which means that at a specific point in time, you know, in USMF, they have version three, while in BRMF, they still have version one. Which is very useful to control which version is sold in different markets, in different companies. And the way to do this is, you know, when we have the product, we release the whole product structure, meaning the bomb and the route as well, with the release product structure button. So we would open a wizard in which we select the product. We can send it active and then we would choose the site because different bombs can have different sites, so we would have to pick the site for the bomb and choose to which company we release it to. And in the case that you know we want to release it to site two, then we would pick site two. The that we're releasing is only for site two on the receiving legal entity. With this way of releasing products, there's actually two very sets of functionality that are very useful. That is, the products can be manually accepted or automatically accepted, meaning if they're automatically accepted, when you release after this release wizard, they would be released to the legal entity that you're releasing to. Or you could have a manual step in which you need to review those details of the product that has been released 
and then accept it. And then the second set of functionality is a lot of defaults and templates that are applied to the product. So in the case that we have chosen the manual acceptance, a person in the receiving legal entity in USMF, as we release to USMF, would go to open product releases and see the products that have been released to that legal entity. Then can click, view the details, and see that the whole product structure was sent. And it was sent with its bill of materials. And you know, maybe the person decided to that it's not relevant to have the bill of material in this side. And then in this legal entity, so not receive it, or maybe change the side. If all is good, then they can accept it. And once it's accepted, it will change from pending acceptance, as you see, it would refresh and then it would come to out of the page and then appear that it's released in the legal entity. Something very important in the release is that it's not only engineering products that you can release with this release product structure method, you can release as well standard products. So a standard product that you has a bill of material or a bomb or a route, you can release it as well. So you don't need to duplicate the bill of material in another legal entity. And there's a lot of templates applied so that in the case that you have always a manual of instruction that needs to be added for that product in a specific legal entity, you will be able to add it using the templates and defaults that are called release policies. So knowing that this is functionality that you can leverage uh, for a standard product, then this comes another set of functionality is super useful and will be available as well for standard products. Not at the moment, but coming in the next wave. It's the product readiness. And it's a way to help you ensure that the relevant data is set before a product is used. So for example, the price of an item or the default order settings or the bomb, you want to ensure that that is set up before the product is used. So these would come with the readiness checks, which are basically checks to ensure that data is filled in. There are three types of checks. System checks, where the system would automatically check if there's a specific data there. It only checks the data. It does not check if it's correct or not. Then there's manual checks where a user is expected to go into the check and perform an action. Like, for example, default order settings. We expect the user to go and fill them manually, or maybe it's not needed so they can skip it. Or they can use checklists, which basically uses the existing questionnaires. And then there you can define your own questions or your own points that they have to follow. And then when they have the needed points, then the check would be complete. This is something that will be available for standard products as well. And then how do we control that our products are used in the right set of transactions? Depending on how far they are on their life, depending on what is their life cycle state. So actually, you know, we have this concept already of life cycle state in dynamics. You probably recognize on top of this screen 
the first part, then we have extended much more. So there's the detailed control of which are the business processes that can be performed for this specific lifecycle state. So you can define yourself the lifecycle states that apply to your company. And for each of the processes, you can choose if that process is enabled, so then it can be performed. If it's enabled, but it will give a warning, like for example, you're selling a product, you may want to have a warning, hey, you're selling this product, but it's a prototype. Or if that process is blocked and then it cannot be performed. So you can choose this by process. You can configure them yourself and you can assign the lifecycle state that applies to your company, which means when the product is created, by default, it will have a lifecycle state. And then when it's released to other companies, you can change the lifecycle state, which means that one product, while it's active on one company, it may be obsolete on another one. This version may be good for an, a country while it's obsolete for another one. And then you'd be able to control it with the lifecycle state. So you will be able to override it at the company level like this. Another set of functionality that is very useful is the engineering attributes. And what are the engineering attributes? So they're attributes. It's the same concept. They describe characteristics of the product. But the engineering attributes can only be assigned to engineering products. When we created the categories, which is the way to manage the engineering products, there you can assign some engineering attributes that can be mandatory or can be optional. And then you can assign as well other engineering attributes to a specific product version. And then this is super useful to track how it changes in different versions. For example, if the material changes, if the diameter of a cable changes, you can use these engineering attributes for. And then the good thing about it is that you can actually do product search on these engineering attributes. So in the case that you have a customer that needs a specific component of a material and of a diameter, then your sales taker that is picking up the order, he would be able to open the product search and then quickly look at what products your company already has on the catalog that feed the customer's requirement. So he'd be, he'll be able to see a list of the products as you see, which of those products are active, go quickly through the details of that engineering version or, or to that product. And then he'll also be able to see which are the products that are on hand. So in this way, you can reuse the products. It's really fast for sales, sales takers and other people to quickly identify those products. And basically, let's re reuse them, minimizing your inventory costs and gets you faster to the market. So you don't have to create another product where you have a similar one that maybe it's good for the customer. And 
And finally, we have the way to keep track of changes in products. And how is this done? So imagine the case that a product has been sold for some months and then a subcomponent has a defect. How would this be found? So anyone could find it on the company and anyone would be able to create a change request. A change request is basically a document which holds some needed suggestions of changes in a product. This is totally integrated and can be triggered from many places in the application. Sales orders, purchase orders, and as you see, you're able to provide information, documents, notes, images, and to which product version they relate to. Then these changes, what does it look like this? You have a change request that has all the information and then you have ways to follow up on it. You have to approve it or you can cancel it if it's not needed. And we, you have some fields like the priority, like the category, like the severity that are very useful for these changes. You can integrate workflow, so you have an approval process where engineers would review it, and depending on the priority or the category or the severity, you would have one process or another. So for example, for urgent things, uh, sorry, it's flickering. Uh, so for urgent things, then you may want to have a faster approval, while for some routine processes, then you may not need it. In the case that this change request is triggered uh, from a sales order or from another source, then at the bottom you can keep as well track of which was the source. So for example, in the case that you have a customer that bought something and he's not happy with the product or he requests some changes, then you'll be able to see that that sales order was the source of the change request. So then an engineer would have this workspace for himself where he's able to see all the change requests by priority, by severity, and then would review what is actually requested. What are those suggestions? What are those issues? And if there needs to be some change on the product, then the engineer can decide to make it. A change order can be made. So in the case that there was a component that was broken, that was wrong, then a change order can be made. In this change order, you of course give an identification, it has a title, it has a status to clarify in which point of the change order it is, if it's open, if it's you know approved and ready. You also have some fields to classify it. Again, you have the category, the priority and the severity that are very useful to classify if you have different workflows. Again, which is an important case, you may want to have it faster than another one. And if those products were changed, actually changed, if they were processed by who and at which time. The changes that are on the products are kept track always in here. 
So the product is added to the impacted products. And then you're able to see which is the change. So let's say we have to make some change in some component that is major. There was some big defect this product cannot be sold at all to the customers. Like the battery is exploding. So then you're gonna need to also notify those customers that the product you sold was wrong, that they shouldn't use it. So a really good set of functionality that you probably wanna leverage is the word used analysis. and the business impact of it. So let's start with the word used. The word used literally tells you where this product is used. So let's say this battery is wrong of a component, then you probably want to change the battery for a new one on all the places where this battery was used. Maybe the battery was for seven speakers, then you want to change those speakers to use a different battery. So from the where used, you can search where it's used, and then you can add these products as well to the change order from the page to change the battery in them. And then the second functionality that is super useful is what is the business impact of this change? You know. The battery has exploded. Have I sold the battery to how many customers? How many sales orders? So using the business impact, then you'll be able to search what are the specific transactions in which this product version was used. So in this case, you're making changes to a product and you see that this product is used in three sales orders, two purchase orders, two production orders. So you see that the product GA001 version three is used, is sold in the company USMF in transaction 785 and two of them were sold. You probably want to block that sales order and you probably want to notify the sales responsible as well so they get in contact with the customer and tell them that they have a product where the battery is wrong so please don't use it. So you can do it from here. You can directly block the order or notify the sales responsible. And you're able to do several actions as well, depending on the type of transaction. And this would be a quick way to assess the changes that are done for a product. It is all triggered from the change orders. So at the point that the engineer is making the changes in the product, they be able to see which are the changes. Now here we are going to see how would be a typical use case a typical flow for how an engineer would treat all these change requests and change orders in a typical case where a product is being modified. So then there's the change management workspace where the engineer would review the change orders and requests.
So for example, the engineer could pick up the open change orders, which means they still have not been reviewed, and review the details. So he can see the information, he can see the products, and here he would see that there are some issues with the power cord that is broken, the quality of the plastic does not see to be red, so he can approve it. From here, he can directly create a change order with copy link and products. From here, he can choose to add this needed change to one of the existing change orders that are opened or to create a new one if none of the existing already apply. There can be many change requests that can be followed on one change order. Imagine several customers giving the same feedback or maybe several design departments, several people from purchase or from sales giving the same feedback. So all that can be followed up with one change order. In case the none applies, then we'll go ahead and create a new one. As this power cord was broken, then we don't want to use it anymore. So we will change from this prototype that was sold to obsolete. Sorry. It just went away. Here, so we would obsolete it. And then we would change the products that use this power cord so they don't use again power cord and they use another one. So then we are going to search where they are used. We see that the power cord is used in those two speakers. We are going to take just the second one and add it to the change request. And then we can go to its spill of materials to the lines, find the power cord, delete it, and then add a new power cord. That in this case, the engineer knows that we have this power cord in the market. So the engineer would add that line. And then this change is important on the speaker. So we want to create a new version of the speaker. So the speaker, the B1, would become a new version, a B2. For each of the impacted product lines, we can actually choose if there's no change, meaning that the changes applied in the, in the change order will be kept on the same product version. If we want to create a new version of the product, like in this case we are creating, we are creating a V2, or if we want to create a new product because the changes are really big. Usually we create a new product when it's form, fit, or function that change. So then the engineer can approve them, or maybe it has to be the engineer manager, and then we would create a workflow so the manager would approve. Process the changes, which when processed is that these changes that are actually kept here locally in the change order are actually applied to the product. So in the legal entity, 
in the engineering organization where this product is controlled, these changes would be made. If we are in the engineering company, and these changes would be applied. Or actually, there's another way in which we can keep local changes, meaning that this change of a product, if it's engineering-wise, it would always be controlled in the engineering organization. But maybe there's a small change that only applies for a legal entity. So in that case, you could be able as well to create a change order just for the specific legal entity in which, let's say, this product is always on the bill of materials, it's always taken from this site or from this warehouse, or, you know, a new uh, manual of instructions in the local language is added, you'll be able to create as well these change orders in the local companies. In this case, remember we are in DMF, in our engineering organization for this product. So then we are going to process the changes and release this new product to where it's needed. So we are selecting the speaker with all its bill of materials and all its components, including the power cord that we change, is going to be released. You see that we are sending the bomb as well with a check on the right. Then we would continue through the wizard and then make it available in the companies where it's needed. And this was all the functionality on engineering change management that you've seen applies to engineering products and some of it to standard products as well. So would it be worth for you, for your customers, if you're partners, now to take a look and even enable if you don't have engineering products, how do you enable it? So you have to enable the first feature called engineering change management. In 10 of 15 and 16, it's preview, but the code is GA quality. The only reason we are not um, having it GA is because our marketing was not ready, but the code is totally ready, GA quality. And then on 10 of 17, it's going to be GA. So first the feature and then the configuration key. For the configuration key, you need to go to license configuration. So for updating this page, you would need to plan a time for getting your system into maintenance mode and then enable the engineering change management configuration key. And if you want to use the version dimension as a dimension, so if you want to keep track of the changes in transactions, then you would need to enable as well the product dimension version. And you can find these two configuration keys under the trade section. And what does this mean for you existing customers? For your customers as partners. So now the choice of versioning product or not comes. So you can create new engineering products for those products that you want to version, but maybe one of the products that you already have that is existing for you in your company, then maybe you want to version that one. So we are actually shipping in 1017 the possibility to convert one of your existing products into an engineering product. 
remember that an engineering product will always have versions and be managed through change management. In the case that you want to apply this conversion, then a product will be created. So we will not be able to change it into a product that uses the version dimension. And what if you don't want to create engineering products? Then you can still leverage some features of the engineering change management with the standard products. You can release the product structure that would release the BOM and the route as well. So it would be super easy for you if you need the same product with the same BOM in two different companies. There's also templates for items. This is the release policies that are applied on release. There's a whole set of fields that are applied, like the default order settings, like, for example, the storage and tracking dimensions. That is something many customers find annoying when they create the shared product and release it to many different companies to specify those if they're always the same for the product. So then you'll be able to leverage the templates for releasing. So you don't have to manually fill those up. The readiness checks for standard products are also coming in April. So it's worth to think if this is something for you. It, this is this will make your processes faster. What about customers that have external PLMs or PDM systems? So as Microsoft, we don't provide integrations with external systems. So you would need your partner or an ISV for the integration. To increase offers the integration uh, with Siemens, Team Center, PDC Windshield, uh, that was part of their product engineering solution that we have not acquired. Also, other, other ISVs, they're updating their solutions to work with engineering change management, such as Blue Star. So in case you need this, please connect with your partner. For existing product engineering customers, off to increase, they are able to migrate to the Microsoft solution at any time that they see fit. They always have the choice and to increase will help with the migration. And in regards to roadmap on what is coming on engineering change management, as I mentioned, you're going to be able to convert a standard product into an engineering product that does not use the version dimension. This is coming in 10.0.17. You're going to be able to use the readiness checks for standard products. That is this is coming in April next year. And you're going to be able to manage changes on your formulas, on your ingredients, on planning items co-on by products that this is coming on April 2021. So this said from an overview of what are these capabilities how you can use them, how you can leverage them, and how is this useful for you and your products. Do we have any relevant questions on the chat, Dennis? My uh, colleague Dennis yes, is on the chat. We do. Let me just, uh, so I've been trying my best to keep up with the question. I can see I managed to answer 35 questions so far, and we have uh, still some in the queue. So let me just uh, read to you the, the most common. Uh, license. So will this uh, functionality be part of the basic license? It's a question that's been 
couple of times? Yes, it is part of the same base and attached licenses um, of supply chain management. There is no additional cost as such only for this functionality. Okay, the next question is, there's a user saying that they downloaded the ECN module, but they did not have, have the test data with it. Should that not be available? In, we ship demo data uh, from 1014. So you would have demo data if you create a new environment. If you upgrade some of your existing ones, then you wouldn't have demo data. It needs to be a new one. Good. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, is it possible to use different inventory units for different versions of a product? Mm. No, the inventory unit is still on the product. Different versions would still use the same unit. Okay, so there's, I'm just taking off the next of the list here. Are you able to update the POs, production orders, etc., directly from the business impact form? There is some actions that you can take from the business impact form like notify the sales responsible, block the production order. So that, yes, you can do from the form. If you want to take other actions, then you can always open the production order and perform it there. Uh, next question will be, uh, is this applicable also to non-produced products? Yes, if it's valuable for you to keep track of the changes, of course you can use an engineering product uh, for keeping track of the changes. The word engineering scares a bit, <laughs> it scares a bit, but you know, don't get scared by the word engineering. It can also be um, all the products as long as it's as it's valuable for you to keep track of the versions, yes, of course, you can use them. Okay, so the next question is, uh, in the product readiness, can we define specific fields on tables as mandatory? Uh, yeah, so this is to be informed. So there are some examples here. So units, cost group, buyer group, coverage group. Mm -hmm. Some of those are already some of the readiness checks that are available, uh, but the rest, no, you cannot choose yourself uh, which are the mandatory fields. You could create a questionnaire, so you ask the user to go to specific fields. Okay, uh, this covers the most part and I can see we're kind of out of time. If you feel like you did not have your question answered, uh, I'm sure you can reach out to either Patrice uh, or myself. My name is Dennis Conrad. I was uh, the lead engineer for this project. Okay, that's great. I'm really glad to see that we answered all the almost all the questions. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Passing it to you, Janice. Thanks for moderating. All right, thank you, Beatrice. All right, everyone, we would like to get your feedback on today's session. I have posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you'd like to see in future sessions. The survey scores are on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible. We do appreciate the time you take to do this and thank you for your support. 
As a reminder, attendees can access the web conference recording by the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and thank you audience for logging in and joining us today.